hello friends the pharma day talks we are on this sunday this is dr shanmu sundaram and dr satish once again we meet you with a new episode of pharma day talks today it is going to be on uh, bioanalytical techniques as promised in the last talk show we brought a international uh, guest today so because uh, the guest is today from us a younger guest who is also a part of a uh, wealth alumni so we'll be introducing the guest shortly to you who is going to talk about the various bioanalytical techniques she is handling and uh, lcms and other analytical techniques and other aspects so that's all uh, this is the intro for the show for today and now it's uh, dr sadish to give us introductory remarks yeah good evening viewers uh, i'm very happy to meet you on again on a beautiful episode in this beautiful evening and uh, Uh, i know that uh, you are you had watched the previous episodes and uh, many people are commenting that each episode is of a different category and uh, with a different specialization so that uh, they are uh, very helpful for them to build up their uh, career and uh, many people any students and uh, uh, young uh, professionals are uh, commenting upon the box that we could see that uh, uh, again uh, we should uh, bring more and more uh, number of uh, professionally trained people to uh, this show and make it more uh, potential so we accept your request and uh, every day we are working on that uh, to bring you new uh, faces and uh, new people who succeeded in their life they succeeded made not simply succeeded by cake walk each people had struggled a lot and they attained their goals or they are on the way to attain the goals so uh, this show is not about the uh, fortunate and lucky people mainly they are fortunate and hard workers they attain their goals by means of hard work and uh, and uh, they had passed through lot of uh, struggles in their way and uh, such people only we are introducing to you in that aspect i hope that uh, today's uh, uh, guest will also be a uh, person who had uh, achieved her uh, main aim of doing a research in uh, in an uh, you are you are us university and uh, uh, that guest also says that uh, she had struggled a lot to achieve this goal because uh, um, men are uh, different from women women they have to take care of their personal uh, personal life and uh, their family family members and also they have to pursue their uh, research so that is a different uh, path they have a different uh, Uh, type of uh, life and uh, so it is really very hard to uh, cross those things so in this direction uh, i am very happy to have this uh, guest today so uh, i request dr shanmu sundaram sir to uh, bring the guest here thank you yeah let me introduce the guest of the day mrs deepika she is from uh, currently she is in atlanta us and uh, she was a uh, alumni from wales college of pharmacy from 2006 to 10 batch actually she done a b pharm there and she has uh, finished her uh, m pharm or uh, pg degree from jntu and currently she is pursuing her uh, phd in us so actually we, she is going to talk about her journey for the past 10 years uh, about her duty pg and phd along with that she will be talking about the various bioanalytical techniques she is handling so that will be very useful for the end generation so now it's time to have a self intro of the guest so i request the guest to have a self introduction about her sure sir thank you for the lovely introduction so hello everyone uh, i am deepika i am an alumni of wales university i would say i'm a proud alumni of wales university i finished my bachelor's uh, around 2006 to 2010 and then i pursued my masters in jawaharlal nehru technological university uh, from 2010 to 2012 and i started my phd uh, here in the us at mercer university in georgia so um, currently i'm in my fourth year uh, i'm done with my thesis work i'm just waiting for a defense date so that i can just submit and graduate so i mean i just uh, quoted everything in just two lines it seemed and it looked pretty easy but it was not that easy actually so uh, i had to like uh, you know cross uh, a lot of uh, finish lines before coming to the stage 
I uh, like uh, in the US to start any degree, you'll have to give uh, a series of entrance exams. So for PhD, I did the same. I gave my GRE, I gave my TOEFL, and uh, of course, like any other student, you'll have to write your SOPs, LORs, and everything. And with the whole application bundle, I was able to secure an admit at Mercy University. And uh, it has been an incredible journey at Mercer. I've learned a lot of stuff here, like with all different cultures, with different people around, different mindsets. It has been a, a very good exposure platform for me, uh, not just from the professional point of view. I have learned personally a lot, uh, you know, like how different people from different cultures, you know, think and how they how they act uh, on thinking. So it's been a great opportunity for me. And uh, throughout my PhD, I've been exposed to a lot of analytical techniques. Uh, I worked out with a variety of instruments. And I should thank my mentors, uh, Dr. Jennifer Kinnack and Dr. Grady Strom. They've been there throughout my PhD and they've guided me through all my tough times. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that I, I'm almost there. I'm close to the finish line right now. I just have to submit my uh, uh, thesis and defend. So there I'll be in, out in the real world now. So I just can't wait to see what uh, you know the future holds for me. But uh, yeah, right now I'm in this stage where uh, uh, I have, a, I would say, a good amount of exposure to various analytical techniques. So I'm taking this opportunity to share whatever I've learned through these years. So it would give you an idea, like, you know, what are the opportunities where you can pursue after your bachelor's and you can, you can pick up on something which interests you the most. So for me, after bachelor's, when I opted for analysis in my master's, that's when I started developing a uh, you know, strong inclination towards analytical techniques. I realized that I started enjoying working with various instruments. So that's when I thought I have to like, you know, pursue my further research in this field. So this made me choose analytical toxicology. Of course, it is pharmaceutical sciences, but the branch exactly is analytical toxicology. So my lab works with analytical toxicology research. So that's the reason I wanted to join in this uh, uh, branch because I, I enjoyed thoroughly working with various analytical instruments. I loved when, you know, like when I see a peak in LCMS, I, it just excites me. So I thought, okay, this is where I belong. So I just wanted to put some more in this field. And um, our lab specifically works with various uh, toxicology related stuff. So we have developed various diagnostic methods for kinds of poisonings like shellfish poisoning or pesticide poisoning or nuclear warfare poisoning. So, you know, like whenever there is a poison sample, our lab brings those really exposed specimens and we develop a diagnostic method to detect the exposure. So that is a part of my project too. Uh, so I just quoted some examples in the presentation today from my project. And uh, I'll just give an overview of uh, how to develop a diagnostic method. I'll discuss more in the presentation though. So yeah, that is all about my lab uh, where we develop uh, various diagnostic methods and in analytical toxicology field. Yeah, thank you for a beautiful self-introduction and what area you are going to talk. So analytical toxicology, a new terminology for the audience and for many people, because everyone is aware of analytical pharmacology. Whereas analytical toxicology is a new terminology. So many will be uh, having a very good, wonderful day today with a new concept. So now let us, because after a few minutes, we can uh, go to in depth about your specialization. Just to start with, you go, go back to your, uh, rewind your memories in Wales. So let us start with 2006. How, how did you come to that time? Where were you? What was your native and how you came to Chennai? So how, how did you enjoy in 2006 to 10 in Wales? Can you have some few words on that? Sure. So I, I did my uh, schooling and plus one plus two in Andhra. Uh, and then after that, uh, we uh, learned about the university through one of the professors, Dr. Baskar Reddy. Uh, and then I approached Wales, Uni Wales University. I submitted my application, and that's how I secured an admit there. And uh, it was a wonderful experience because uh, I mean, I, I just shouldn't say this in front of you, but all the professors were so supportive, and uh, we were exposed to a wide variety of uh, you know like fields and techniques there. 
and the lab sessions i used to enjoy the lab sessions a lot uh, the pharmacology session from dr anbu sir and dr sumitra ma'am and biochemistry by dr vasuki ma'am and organic chemistry by dr shanmukh sundaram sir so we we did a lot of lab sessions we used to enjoy those labs um, and even for the theoretical part we used to uh, like we got exposed to a lot of uh, you know like topics it gave us a comprehensive idea about a wide variety of topics and i still remember that uh, the library of wales university was one of the top notch libraries uh, at that point of time uh, i was just uh, blown away by the collection of you know all the materials and the books and you know, all the pharmacopias and stuff like that in the libraries you you have everything in that in the library whatever you need to you know come up with a project or you know prepare for an exam so i personally utilized a lot from that library so uh, not just that uh, all the facilities provided at wales university uh, clearly helped me a lot uh, to come out of bachelor of pharmacy with flying colors uh, i secured a gp of 4.0 for 4.0 uh, in my bachelor's uh, that laid a very strong foundation for me for my further studies because that's where i was first exposed to what is pharmacy actually until i joined b pharmacy in wales i have no idea what is actually pharmacy what do people in pharmacy deal with i i just don't have a very clear idea i would say but at the end of bachelor's uh, it gave me a very comprehensive idea in fact i would say it uh, it uh, actually laid a foundation for me from where i just kick started my career so um, and also in the final year i think i have taken a pharmaceutical analysis course from dr pratima mathur ma'am that's when i i got interest in this analytical techniques because that's when i got first exposed to hplc uv you know that was all new for me but it seemed very fascinating you know how these techniques are used the instrumentation part so that uh, made me to choose uh, analytical uh, pharmaceutical analysis as my you know like uh, the field of interest in masters so yeah bachelors i would say that uh, it gave me a wonderful uh, experience many wonderful memories there with my friends because i used to stay in hostel so i still miss them uh, we just get in contact with each other through you know social media these days but those were wonderful days because we just finished up plus one plus two and we started a bachelors we we all were so uh, naive and innocent and we started everything together so and that's the first time i stayed away from my family so uh, it gave me a sense of independence also i started uh, to learn how to you know stay independently so that was a wonderful experience like both on professional and personal front okay you are in touch with your batchmates now yes yes i am in touch with a lot of batchmates uh, like of course all my uh, uh, almost 50 to 60% of my bachelor uh, friends are still in contact we have a whatsapp group so we contact and we talk to them like on a very regular basis yeah and it's pretty fascinating to see how everybody settled everybody each one is in a different place so it's it's very nice to see all of them settled in their fields so uh, actually you you plan to do your career directly with bachelors to m post graduate or you wanted to take a break what was your journey from post ug to pg how was your journey over there i think i didn't take a break i immediately joined in masters like i finished my bachelors in 2010 uh, august and i started my uh, masters in 2010 october uh, in jawaharlal nehru technological university in uh, andhra and uh, i think it took 2 years uh, to finish my masters from 2010 to 2012 out of which the first one year is uh, like in class courses where you have to stay in the university to finish all your credits and course curriculum and the second year of masters i i did an internship at a pharma company called therdos pharma in hyderabad uh, that is where i got more exposure to these analytical techniques i during my internship it lasted for almost 8 months i guess during that period i got some really good hands on experience for hplc where i developed a, a you know like a simultaneous estimation method for few solid dosage forms like atovastatin calcium phenofibrate norlistat i even published that work in a in a journal so that's where i you know like i would say i had a little more 
more of experience with analytical techniques. So Theridos Pharma from Hyderabad, that's the company I worked. And uh, it was an eight month, eight to nine month internship program. And uh, yeah, I, I developed the method and I validated it according to FDA guidelines. So then I presented it again in my master's uh, university to you know obtain the degree. So I think it was from 2010 to 2012 when I completed my master's. So it was like in a stretch. I didn't take a break between bachelor's and master's. That was a thing since your first year, since BCom, you had a passion for cleaning and analytics. Same thing you continued in your master's so that you were able to strengthen yourself on the same specialization. That is what I guess. Because from BFARM, with Pratima Madhu's guidance, you started with the HPLC trainings and your projects and whatever it is. And Master also has specialized in your analytical techniques and uh, wonderfully you got into a good company so that you are able to get a eight, eight to nine months hands on training. That was more important because theoretical knowledge will help only to a certain extent. Only the practical knowledge will give us uh, practical difficulties what we face on a day to day basis because the theoretical knowledge will stop with the existing drugs, whereas the practical knowledge will be with the day to day with the new drugs, new concepts, new FDA guidelines and other things. So we have a lot of challenges on practical uh, things on everyday basis. We have to face the instrumental techniques and uh, oh, that you would also experience and still be experiencing in your day to day practice of uh, learning new skills and other things. So right. I think your journey from PG to PhD was a big lengthy journey. So now yeah. I may talk uh, Sadi sir to have a detailed discussion on the PG to PhD journey so, so that it will be helpful for the juniors who is having an idea because everyone thinks that one or two times if you strike a ball they immediately they get a seat. That's not the case. We want to proper pursue the passion or continue the dream. They have to keep on knocking the door then only the door opens. It doesn't open. May, it may open for some on the first instance for sure. many dope on second or third instance, many takes three or four instances to happen, but we should be passionate enough to pursue our dream. So I think you can, uh, in depth, you can talk with Dr. Satish to uh, how you are from PG to PhD. After that, we'll have your presentation on the analytical techniques, then we'll continue sure. over that. So now it's over to Dr. Satish for the discussion. Hello, Deepika, and uh, uh, I am more interested to know how uh, you landed in uh, uh, US uh, first, uh, you landed for PhD with an aim to do PhD, or for personal familial reasons, you reached uh, the destination of uh, US, and then after some time, you started doing PhD. Why well, I'd like to so, know? That. Yeah, so sure, sure, yeah. Uh, in fact, I I actually got uh, my master's in 2012, and I got married in 2013. Uh, that's when I moved to US with my husband. And uh, I started preparing for GRE and TOEFL like within a month after moving to US because I always I always wanted to do PhD and I thought that it's the right time because I need to start early on in my career. I mean, there's need, there's really no break in my career from 2006 to 2010. I did my bachelor's, 2010 to 2012 I did my master's, 2013 I got married. I came to the US and I started preparing for PhD in 2013 itself. And, so. Uh, so you're uh, very very much uh, passionate about doing PhD and uh, your uh, goal was very well fixed earlier itself. So yes. PhD is your next uh, destination that you marked very clearly. So yes. uh, after uh, reaching US, uh, how long uh, did you uh, took for uh, uh, getting the admission from date of okay. preparation to after uh, so you had decided on some day that you have to prepare for uh, getting an admission from right. that point. How much time you have to work for getting an admission, secure an admission in an university? Right. So uh, typically, like how it works in the US is there are two uh, admission intakes. One is fall intake, one is spring intake. Fall intake is like it, it, it admits the students in August and spring intake, it admits the students in January. So I moved to the US in March, 2013 March. So I cannot enter in August because it's like too early. Usually the admissions close at least seven to eight months before, you know, like they start picking the candidates, especially for PhD. It's like, it's very competitive here. For each batch, I think they just take like five to six students. So it's it's not a lot uh, for, I'm talking about a single university. If you take one university, 
uh, like for example in pharmaceutical uh, sciences uh, field it will take just 5 to 6 students per intake so it's like very highly competitive uh, so it's not like you'll be able to get it in your first try if you get it you're you're lucky or fortunate enough but uh, you just have to keep that backup option in mind that you might get accepted in the next semester so you'll have to start it way before you know in order to avail for various assistantships and fellowships too so the earlier you apply the earlier they consider your application and you'll be considered for various fellowships and assistantships also so when i moved in march i think i started my preparation from may i just took like one two months to adjust to this you know new atmosphere new place and uh, i started taking the gre uh, coaching online um and uh, you know like we are biology students we don't have much of math background so i think the last time i did my math was in 10th grade after that i didn't do anything related to math but gre has math in it i should thank my husband for that he helped me a lot related to the math concepts the probability and you know all the statistical concepts so he, he helped me out in understanding those concepts so uh, i think i prepared uh, for 3 months for gre and i gave my uh, exam in october i guess and then in november i gave my toefl so it will take at least two months for them to you know scrutinize the application and start sending out the admits and then i got uh, from december and january i didn't hear from them because that's the holiday season here and i think in february i i heard heard back from them that i got an admit for 2014 august uh, fall semester So, so in short uh, we can take that around uh, you took around one year of hard preparation and uh, uh, hard working is required for getting an admission in uh, us can i take yes. like that yes okay. i would say typically uh, you know like throughout the preparation application process and hearing back from the university the whole process will take at least one year one year good yeah. so uh, how you felt on the first day after admitting uh, to the mercer's university first day when you are entering into the university as a phd scholar how was yeah. your feeling i i was just so ecstatic i mean i in fact when i received the email that i got an admit that was a very 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 happy moment for me because uh, they said that we are admitting you to the phd program at so and so university we are offering you a special fellowship so when all those accolades started showing up it uh, i felt really happy and uh, i mean at one point i just got scared because i have a very long road ahead of me because phd is a very a uh, long commitment it's just not a year or two uh, you'll have to fix your mind and everything for at least 5 years you know so you need to be very uh, focused and dedicated at least first of all you have to be prepared that you know you'll have to stay in that particular line for at least 5 years so that thought was slightly intimidating but uh, it was just overcome by the ecstatic feeling that i i got into my uh, my dream program so i it was very it was very nice because uh, when i entered the university i've seen people from different cultures different backgrounds you know it's very interesting to hear how they think about you know a particular problem each person thinks differently and uh, like especially from different cultures and different backgrounds it was it was a great experience i i i would say like it should be experienced at least once in a lifetime because it will teach you a lot of things so yeah at uh, the first day i still remember i even posted it on my facebook that because i was so excited it i just it just made me like so who accompanied you who accompanied you towards uh, the university my husband my husband yeah. km he dropped me at the university he he is my uh, guide and philosopher <laughs> he is there at every walk of my life uh, throughout the phd so he dropped me and um i had to you know like um, i i was uh, i was the only indian student who got admitted that year so Great. i think they took four students one of them was chinese one of them was korean and one of them was from bangladesh and i was the only indian student so oh. the thing is you don't have much in common to discuss in the beginning so you talk to them you make small talks but uh, it's not like you you can just interact with them in the very first meeting right because we don't have much in common 
but uh, uh, so i i felt a little um, it felt a little strange but eventually uh, the pharma background was the only common thing among us so when we started discussing our backgrounds and from where where we came from that's when i started interacting with all of them so yeah so before going into much about our uh, phd travel uh, i want to hear from you how uh, hard it was to carry the research as well as your personal life together in us it is um, it is very difficult <laughs> on a scale of 10 i would rate it as 8 <laughs> because uh, <laughs> i mean one thing we have to keep in mind is like we are we are away from our family here so you don't have a lot of family support i mean uh, so which is good in one way because you learn to manage everything on your own you will try to be more individualistic that way rather than being dependent so that is a good thing but uh, the whole process is little um, it it is a little tough uh, because you have my- uh, one question please uh, do you have any kids now yes i do i have a 14 month uh, old baby girl so she was born in uh, may 2019 last year so that was the toughest part of my phd like even while i was pregnant i used to go to the lab and finish my research i think i worked till i was 7 to 8 months uh, throughout my pregnancy uh, because i was running out of time i had to finish my research so even while while i was pregnant i went back and i worked uh, i would thank my baby because she didn't trouble me a lot she was very calm so i could finish my research and uh, yeah i think uh, from last may i took almost 4 3 months of maternity leave then i got back to work and uh, i finished whatever is left and right now i'm writing my cases yeah very good so now you say something about uh, how the uh, life in that campus you told that pharmacy is the only common thing for you to discuss with your friends and yeah. uh, Uh, in a later stage how it changed is there have you could able to experience any change and how far uh, the research uh, uh, orientation is there for you in that uh, university right so uh, i mean the more we started uh, you know taking classes and working on our projects so we used to have this common collaborative projects where you work with other students from other labs you know like you'll have to use their techniques learn some techniques from them so that way i got a very good chance to interact with a wide variety of students and it is surprising to know what is their take on a particular problem so if there is a, a troubleshooting issue with some instrument per se for lcms there will be a lot of troubleshooting issues so everybody has their own theories why this could have happened so when i have one thing on my mind when i talk to these people i came to know different ideas you know like what they are thinking so it's very surprising because i never even thought in that angle so um, so it's good that way because you get exposed to you know different uh, ways of thinking um, so few are very good with their troubleshooting skills few are very good with their method development skills so when i interacted with all of them that's when i could you know take all the positives from each of them and uh, have an overall comprehensive development yeah and the curriculum was also really good because uh, here the curriculum is more of an interactive curriculum so we used to have these sessions where you have to take a, a pick up a journal paper and uh, criticize the paper you know like not just reading the paper you will have to come up with all the negatives in the paper all the comments so that way you'll start thinking critically so uh, that actually helped me you know like develop uh, that critical thinking also so in you are told that you are in mercer's university georgia and uh, uh, what is the highlight of this university in pharmacy particularly uh, i would say the inter collaborative uh, projects uh, it has a wide variety of research being done in uh, under the heading of pharmaceutical sciences so there is a lab which is working with vaccine development uh, one of them has uh, recently started doing some covid 19 vaccine development uh and one of the lab is doing neuropharmacology where they are seeing the effect of various uh uh drug abuse drug abuse substances on uh, you know human brain 
and there is another lab uh, which is doing all the formulation all the transdermal drug delivery and our lab is doing bioanalytical analytical toxicology stuff so there is a wide variety of labs and the good thing is all the labs are adjacent to each other so it's it's really easy for me to get exposed to a wide variety of topics you know like used to have these uh, seminars where every week one person from each lab they present their work so that way you get to understand okay what this lab is doing how is it related can i learn anything from that because from that uh, you can come up with different ideas whatever you can inculcate in your project so that's the best thing i would say because it has a, a wide variety of interdisciplinary uh, research going on in there okay deepika it was uh, good to hear your journey it has very interesting Maybe your journey took you for one month to join PSC, but after PSC, you are enjoying the PSC journey. Yeah. And, uh, your research and maternity, your personal life, and uh, your research life are balancing very properly. So now, uh, actually, uh, yes, we can also invite you in a later stage to uh, give a special talk to our students because who is having an interest to pursue uh, PhD or uh, PG in uh, US, you can give an outline. So that they can do the outline. So that will be a separate session. We can have it a personal thing on the college uh, portal. Sure. Now it's uh, time to give you your presentation so that sure. the, uh, whatever skills you have learned, the audience also will learn. So yeah. that your planetary skills and uh, if any questions from the audience in the chat box, we can take it up. Then okay. again, continue with your uh, journey. It's almost 30 minutes now. So you sure. can give a presentation for 15 minutes. Then we can again come back for a discussion. During sure. presentation, you will be the presenter. You will not have any interactions. And okay. start your presentation. Sure, sir. So I'll just share my screen now. So, uh, can you see the presentation, sir? Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, so I think it's time for me to get a little more technical. So uh, today I am going to talk about, uh, uh, you know, a diagnostic method development. Like I said, our lab works with uh, developing various kinds of diagnostic methods. So uh, like I just want to share a few of the skills which I've learned throughout my PhD. So I just uh, made this a uh, small presentation on how to develop a typical diagnostic method. So first of all, why do we need a diagnostic method? What is a diagnostic method? So if you're working in a lab, you get uh, exposed or you, you encounter a variety of specimens. So when you have an exposed specimen, like we'd say it could be plasma or blood or urine or serum, it could be anything, any matrix which has been exposed to an antigen or a toxin or a poison, we need a typical diagnostic method to detect the exposure. So you can relate this to current situation that is COVID-19 where viral particle can be treated as an antigen. So when you have uh, uh, an exposed specimen, like a person who has been exposed to COVID-19, you need a diagnostic method to detect the exposure to see whether or not the person is actually exposed. So uh, to do that, uh, we need a series of steps. So this is gonna be the outline of my presentation for today. First, I'll be discussing some extraction methods which are required to extract your antigen of interest from your matrix. And then you need a detection technique because once you extract the antigen, you need to quantify it, right? So you need a detection technique for that. So I'll just discuss a couple of extraction techniques and one detection technique just to give you an idea. And this whole process usually takes uh, uh, one to two days. So, but when you are in a scenario where you are looking for a very quick result, like whether or not the person is exposed, that's when you opt for screening assays. So I'll be discussing uh, uh, some stuff about the screening assays, and then I'll talk about the current tests which are being used for COVID-19 testing. All right, so um, let's see what is an experimental approach for actually developing a diagnostic method. So the first step is to extract, you know, like we have to develop an extraction method that is, uh, if you have an exposed plasma sample, for example. So apart from the COVID-19 viral particle, there are other stuff in the plasma, right? Like it has clotting factors, it has protein like albumin, heparin, and it has glucose factors. It has all the junk in there, which we are not interested in. We just want to extract our uh, analyte of interest or the antigen, which is a viral particle. 
So we need to extract it from the rest of the matrix for which we need an extraction method. So I'll be discussing a couple of extraction methods in the further slides. So once we extract it, we need to dry it and reconstitute it in a suitable solution so that it can be proceeded to further analysis. Then uh, I'm going to talk about a detection technique uh, where you can quantify the exposure. All right. So the first uh, thing is extraction methods. Uh, like I said, we need to extract our analyte of interest from the matrix. For that, I'm going to talk about two extraction methods. One is solid phase extraction. One is immunoaffinity extraction. Let me discuss them in more detail. First comes solid phase extraction. This is actually carried out uh, by using extraction cartridges. It has a solid uh, sorbent, uh, which is adsorbed inside the cartridges. These are uh, used to separate our antigen or toxin of interest from the rest of the matrix. So how does it work? I'll just show a little uh, animation to you know uh, show you how it works. So we have all these cartridges lined up here. And of course, you need the collection tubes. The first thing you do is you condition the cartridges because the cartridges are pretty new. So you need to wet them uniformly so that the extraction will be efficient. This can be done by using an organic and an aqueous buffer. Once the cartridges are conditioned, we add or we load our samples. We have these exposed samples, right? Like the specimens which have been exposed to a particular virus or toxin. So we add them to these cartridges and the whole separation occurs. It occurs based on the physical and chemical properties of our antigen and the sorbent. Once the separation occurs, the next thing is to wash them. Why do we need to wash it? Because like I said, the plasma has other junk which we are not interested in. We are interested only in the uh, viral particles, like for say if you're developing it for COVID-19. So we need to wash the rest of the junk from the plasma um, so that it avoids all the non-specific binding and any background interference. Once you wash it, now we have our analyte or toxin of interest which is adsorbed on this cartridge. So we need to collect it, right? So we need to elude. That's the final step. So of course, you replace the waste collection tubes with the uh, uh, collection tubes. And then you elute your analyte of interest by using a suitable elution solution. It depends uh, what elution solution to use based on the nature of your compound. You can use uh, an organic solvent or a mixture of organic aqueous solvent with a buffer. It depends. So once you do that, you can elute your toxin. This is how a solid phase extraction works. The next is immunoaffinity extraction. As the name itself indicates immuno, it utilizes the property of antigen and antibody-based interaction. So it utilizes the property to extract your analyte of interest from a matrix. So for that, this is carried out in a spin column format. First, we take an empty spin column and you add agarose beads or magnetic beads as solid support, okay? So now that the solid support is ready, the next thing we are going to do is add an antibody. We choose the antibody specific to your antigen of interest. Then we incubate this antibody so that they bind to the beads. And uh, the next step is to wash away any unbound antibody to avoid non-specific binding. So uh, once the antibodies are ready, the next step is to obviously load your sample, right? We have this exposed specimen which is assumed to have some sort of, uh, you know, like toxin or even COVID virus in it. So we, we uh, load that sample onto this uh, bounded antibodies. And then we incubate it so that there is an antigen antibody interaction. And then we wash it to remove any unbound sample contents, all the junk which we are not interested in. And the final step, of course, is to elute your sample of interest and proceed for detection. So either it could be solid phase extraction or immunoaffinity extraction. The whole purpose of doing this extraction procedure is to isolate or purify your analyte of interest from the rest of the matrix. So once you're done with this extraction procedures, uh, you collect your uh, uh, analyte of interest and you dry it uh, under vacuum evaporation and then reconstitute it using a solution which is suitable for analysis. So now that we are done with extraction, so the next step is obviously to collect uh, the material and proceed for detection, right? So I'll talk about one detection technique. I'm talking about LCMS because it is one of the most widely used detection techniques. Uh, there are uh, other detection techniques, but this is one of the commonly used one. So I would like to give a brief overview of this. As many of you uh, uh, might know, LCMS is a hybrid technique which combines 
the separating power of HPLC and detecting power of mass spec. This is a typical HPLC, which has, of course, a solvent reservoir, column compartment, auto sampler, you know, like, and the pump. So this is how a HPLC works, and it helps or it separates the sample contents by partitioning between stationary phase and mobile phase. Once the sample are, once the sample is separated, it is proceeded to mass spec for detection. Let's see what happens in mass spec. Once the sample enters into mass spec, it is forced into ion source by through a nebulizer needle. It all occurs under a pressure called nebulizer pressure, into which the sample enters into the ion source. And then it gets converted into gas phase ions. Then these ions enter into the mass analyzer, where all the ion sorting occurs. What is ion sorting? These ions get separated based on their mass to charge ratio. That is called sorting of ions. And this is where all the precursor and product ions are formed. Once these ions are formed, they enter into the detector for detection. Uh, and the signal is amplified here. And of course, it is recorded in a data system, which could be a computer. Uh, and this is a, this is how a typical mass spectrum looks like. So this is the overall like general schematic for how an LCMS works. And uh, in order to develop an LCMS method, you need to uh, optimize a wide variety of parameters. Like for example, for LC parameters, you need to optimize flow rate, injection volume, mobile phase, like what is the organic phase, what is the aqueous phase, do you have to use any buffers, and what could be the runtime and the gradient condition. Like do you want to go for isocratic or gradient illusion? So you have to figure out all these parameters as far as the LC print is concerned. And for the MS, um, you'll have to figure out all the precursor and product ions. Uh, you know, this precursor and product ions are very unique for each compound. So this set the transition is like a fingerprint transition for every compound. Uh, so no two compounds have the same set of precursor and product ions. So that will help in actually identifying the compound, right? So you need to figure out the precursor and product ions and the fragmentation voltage and collision energies associated with these ions. And of course, the nebulizer pressure with which uh, the ions enter into the ion source and the capillary voltage where the ions are sorted based on their mass to charge ratio. These are just few parameters which I'm discussing here. There are other parameters which needs to be optimized in order to develop a, a, an optimal LCMS, efficient LCMS method. So this is how a typical, uh, I just pulled some of the data from my own research just to show you how a chromatogram and a calibration curve looks like. So this is a typical chromatogram. This is a multiple reaction monitoring chromatogram of uh, one particular compound. You have retention time on x-axis and you have the absorbance units or uh, you know area on y-axis. And uh, this is a calibration curve where you have concentration on x-axis and relative response, that is a response uh, relative to the internal standard on y-axis. And uh, of course, the closer the R square is to one, the better the method is. So 0.99 is a pretty good R square. So you're aim you aiming for something like that. So this is how a typical chromatogram and a calibration looks like for an LCMS uh, method. So what we have done so far, uh, you have received an exposed specimen to your lab. You extracted the specimen so that you can you know, purify or isolate your antigen. And then you have uh, used a detection technique like LCMS to quantify the antigen. So you extracted the antigen and you quantified the exposure. So this is how uh, a typical diagnostic method is developed. But this whole process, like I said, it will take at least one to two days. But uh, it gives you a very accurate and quantitative identification of a particular exposure. It can be a poison or toxin or even an antigen like COVID-19. Um, in some scenarios, when you are looking for just a positive or negative result, like you're not interested in the quantitative part of it, but you just wanted to know whether the person is exposed or not. That's when you go for screening assays. ELISA is one such screening assay. ELISA stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of different types of ELISA, just, uh, just in a nutshell. The first step of ELISA is direct ELISA. Here, the antigen is coated onto the well of the ELISA plate, and a labeled primary antibody uh, is used for detection. This antibody is uh, conjugated to an enzyme like HRP, that is horse radish peroxidase enzyme. 
The next type of ELISA is indirect ELISA. Here also the antigen is first coated onto the well of an ELISA plate and an unlabeled primary antibody is added to the, is incubated with the antigen. And then a detection antibody, uh, which is, uh, you know, conjugated to an enzyme is added for detection. The next type of ELISA is sandwich ELISA. It works with a matching pair of antibodies. One is capture antibody and one is detection antibody. So the first step is to add the capture antibody to the well of the ELISA plate. And then you add your antigen of interest. And then you proceed either with direct ELISA or indirect ELISA for detection. The last type of ELISA is competitive ELISA. The principle for this is there is a competition between the antigen and uh, the enzyme conjugate for the antibody, uh, you know, to uh, figure out the exposure. Out of these four ELISAs, uh, sandwich and competitive ELISAs are the most widely used techniques. So I'd like to discuss more about these two. Um, so let's say, let's take uh, sandwich ELISA, uh, for example. So like I said, ELISA is carried out in a 96 plate well format. So this is how a typical ELISA plate looks like. So let's see, uh, let's assume these are the wells and see what happens in each well. The first thing you do is you add uh, or you coat the well of the ELISA plate with capture antibody. Then you add your sample, you know, the exposed specimen, which, which has, uh, along with your antigen of interest, it has other junk. Like I said, if you take an exposed plasma sample, along with your coronavirus, uh, it has uh, other factors like um, uh, clotting factors, albumin, parin, you know, like uh, glucose factors and stuff like that, which we are not interested in. We just want to isolate or uh, separate our analyte of interest. So when you incubate the sample with the antibody, uh, eventually the antigen of interest will bind to the antibody. Then you need to wash the uh, well so that you can remove the junk from the plasma. This is important to avoid any non-specific binding because it might give to a very bad background interference. And then we add the detection antibody, which is conjugated to an enzyme like HRP, that is horse radish peroxidase. And then we uh, wash, I mean, we incubate so that the antibody is bound to the antigen. And once washed, any unbound labeled antibody is removed. Now we add a substrate, which is very specific to the enzyme. Like for example, uh, example, sorry, TMB. So the reaction between the enzyme and the substrate like TMB results in a colored product whose absorbance can be measured in a plate reader. So if there is a color change, it means there is a reaction between the enzyme and the substrate, right? So if there is an en a reaction between enzyme and substrate, it means that there is an antigen and antibody interaction. So if there's a color change, it means it is positive. So you have that antigen or you have that virus present in you. So that's how they say if you're corona positive or negative. So this is uh, one type of ELISA which can be uh, used uh, for detection. Another type of ELISA is competitive ELISA where you have an antibody and there is a, a competition between the antigen which is present in your specimen sample and an enzyme conjugate. They both compete for this particular antibody. And the substrate, which is specific to the an enzyme conjugate, is added. And the reaction is indicated by a color change whose absorbance is measured using a plate reader. And of course, you can uh, calculate the concentration based on the calibration curve. So this is another type of ELISA. So uh, it usually takes two to three hours to do an ELISA assay. So it's pretty much fast and pretty quick compared to the detection techniques. So it will just quickly give you a, a yes or no result. Like for example, if you have an exposed specimen, you would be able to figure out whether the person has been exposed to or not exposed to, like positive or negative result. Uh, it will, it may not give you the exact quantitative exposure, but it will definitely give you a qualitative result, like whether or not the person is exposed to that particular virus. So this is uh, all about screening assays. Uh, so these are different types or different strategies to develop a diagnostic method. So either you can extract it and detect it by using an analytical technique, which will take some time, but it will give you an exact quantitative exposure of how much amount of toxin the person is exposed to and what kind of toxin is exposed to. And there is another type of strategy where you develop a quick screening assay where you might not get idea about, uh, you know, the quantitative exposure, 
but you would know whether or not the person is exposed to that particular toxin or virus. All right, so this will take like one to two days and this takes around two to three hours. So this is like qualitative, semi-qualitative uh, result and this is the quantitative result. So based on your needs and based on what you're looking for, you need to figure out what kind of strategy you're gonna employ. And also for extraction methods, there are two different methods I discussed, like solid phase and immune affinity. You can choose what extraction method you want based on uh, what you're looking for and the availability of the equipment and materials in your lab. You know, like, do you have hands-on to some of this equipment? Based on that, you can figure out what extraction method and what detection technique you can use. So uh, this is the whole strategy of developing a typical diagnostic method. And um, I just would like to discuss a little bit of, about uh, tests which are currently being used for COVID-19. So according to FDA, uh, it has approved two different tests under uh, emergency use authorization category. So the two tests which have been approved by FDA, I'll be discussing it briefly here. The first test is a viral test. So these, uh, this kind of test, they detect the person has a current infection. Uh, so this will say if you're currently exposed to coronavirus or not, okay? And uh, this is actually done by using a swab test where you collect a sample from your respiratory system by using a swab test in your, in your nose or your throat. And uh, it is usually carried out in an instrument called RT-PCR, which I'll be discussing in the further slides. This is one type of uh, test which is approved by FDA. Another type of tests are antibody tests. This test cannot detect a current infection. As the name itself indicates, antibody tests are looking for antibodies, right? So when you get exposed to an infection, your body takes at least one to three weeks to produce that particular antibody. So these antibody tests cannot uh, detect current infection. Rather, they can detect the past infection. So once you get this test done, you would have, you would know whether you were previously exposed to this particular virus. And if so, do you have an immune response? So did you produce any antibodies for this virus? This is what you're gonna look for in this type of test. Why is it essential? Because if you produce antibodies for this, uh, uh, for a particular uh, antigen or a virus, uh, it means that there is a very less probability or in fact, zero probability that you might get affected by that virus again. So uh, in order to figure that out, they're doing this antibody tests. So this is a serological test. That is, uh, we collect the serum. Uh, it could be blood or plasma, and uh, we, we continue the test. We use the human blood or plasma, which has, which has been exposed to this virus to actually do the analysis. This is done by ELISA which we just discussed. And I'll show you how they actually apply to COVID-19. So let's see viral tests. Like I said, it is done by RT-PCR. RT-PCR stands for reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. So um, this is the instrument which is used for uh, testing the uh, coronavirus and the current infection. So it works on the principle of reverse transcription. So what you do is when you have an exposed sample in your lab, the first thing you do is extract the RNA from the coronavirus. Once you extract the RNA, you generate the DNA by reverse transcription. So that hence the name reverse transcriptase. So from RNA, we generate the DNA by reverse transcription. And of course, you need a lot of factors for that, like DNT, magnesium ions, and other transcription factors to facilitate this reverse transcription. Once the DNA is produced, uh, generated, we amplify the DNA by polymerase chain reaction. And uh, based on the signal, you will figure out, you know, whether or not the person is exposed to the virus. So this, uh, like I already discussed, this will uh, give you information about the current infection. This will tell you if you are currently exposed to coronavirus or not. The next type of tests are antibody tests. And of course, ELISA is uh, one assay which can uh, do that. Uh, and ELISA stands for enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. So the first thing you do is you take the ELISA well, ELISA plate, and you coat the well with the SARS-CoV-2 protein, which is the coronavirus protein. And then we take the exposed samples, the so samples which come to our lab to be tested. These samples are incubated with the protein. So this is a this is an antibody test, right? 
So if the antibodies are there in the sample, they will have to bind with the protein, right? So the antibodies bind to the protein and they form an antibody protein complex, which can be detected by using colorimetric or fluorimetric detection. So uh, if there is a color change, it means there is an antibody protein complex formed, which shows that the antibodies are present in this particular sample. That means this person has been previously exposed to COVID-19 and he has a primary immune response and uh, he has produced antibodies for this virus. And uh, there is a very little chance that this person might get exposed to the virus again. So uh, this is how a typical ELISA works for uh, coronavirus uh, testing. And um, I would like to just briefly uh, give a particular interesting fact here. CDC has initially developed a, a test which can uh, detect uh, just the SARS-CoV-2 virus in any exposed specimen. But recently, another test has been developed where you can simultaneously detect the influenza virus along with coronavirus. I think two types of influenza virus, virus A and B, can be detected along with coronavirus. I mean, this is a very, uh, this is a good breakthrough because uh, you are detecting almost three types of virus simultaneously. So you are monitoring uh, the coronavirus spread. At the same time, you're keeping a surveillance on influenza spread. Because you're doing simultaneously, you're saving a lot of materials, a personal, because the biggest challenge right now is we are running off test supplies, right? So when you're doing simultaneously, you're going to save uh, time, uh, you know, the materials and the personnel and the uh, speed is, is also increased and you get the results three times faster. So I thought it's a it's a it's a very good, interesting breakthrough and it's, a, it's an interesting fact to share. So, yep, that's pretty much it. This is what CDC is doing right now. And uh, I'm open to any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it was a clear and wonderful presentation, uh, Mrs. Deepika. So, you, so, especially the last part of it will be uh, very useful for the current situation for the audience to know how the COVID-19 is approved uh, by FDA for testing and what are the tests is going on. Because everyone knows about the swab testing because everyone, many are undergoing the swab testing and they are seeing the swab testing in the thing. But the swab testing is only for the current infection, whereas the other thing, the antibody testing is really, because may, some of them might have got uh, infected also, but due to the immune system, they are able to fight against it. Right. Which is unaver to them, actually. Right. Many may be unaware of that, whether they are infected and they are fighting it again. So that can be tested by the second test, like your antibody test. Right. So and, uh, the clear explanation on the different types of ELISA, because everyone knows ELISA, ELISA, ELISA test, but there are four different models of ELISA and what are these models have been used and uh, your uh, analytical uh, techniques on your LTMS, how thin when you receive a sample, how you are going to extract the sample, then you have to separate the sample, you develop a diagnostic technique for that, selection technique, and you direct the sample. So this right. gives a clear view for the audience how to handle a sample. So right. there is a one question from the audience is that, uh, what about the pool testing for COVID-19? Do you have any idea on that? What pool. about the pool testing? For COVID-19. Pool testing, you mean like, Pooling the samples, or what? What? Yes, does it's a, it's a technique in which uh, a, a sample, some hundred samples are collected together, and we will uh, test it for uh, in RT PCR for yes. uh, the presence of the antigen. And if uh, this hundred samples, if any one or two is infected, also it will give a, a positive test, and then they they will be individually identified and uh, for the infection. Okay. So this is uh, this can uh, to some extent it can save the uh, uh, material of uh, test material and other things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Both the audience is listening and yes, they got the answer exactly what they wanted. And a few audience also given a thumbs up and uh, good. They appreciated your presentation. So they are with you and I think one of few of your friends are also listening to from your particular lab and yeah, they are all online and. Uh, some of the biological specialists uh, is also online. They, you know, the likes and uh, things for the thing. So let us proceed with our uh, talk on your. Since in the starting of the show, you 
spoke something about analytical toxicology. Right. Right. So, can you give any one example of analytical toxicology you have carried out in your uh, lab or your study, which you can? Sure. Yeah. So I can talk about my project itself. My project is uh, I have developed a diagnostic method for uh, a typical kind of poisoning called paralytic shellfish poisoning. So when people consume the shellfish from unmonitored regions like Alaska, where the shellfish is not, uh, you know, like there is no regulatory conditions for that. They just, uh, you know, like catch the wild shellfish and they eat it. They consume it. So there is a risk for that because these shellfish might be contaminated with a group of toxins called as paralytic shellfish toxins. Uh, for example, goniotoxin, saxitoxin, neosaxitoxin. The shellfish are, however, immune to these toxins. Nothing happens to the shellfish when they get, uh, you know, when they consume these toxins. But when humans consume this contaminated shellfish, that's when the actual problem occurs. So it uh, the symptoms just start with tingling or numbing sensation, and it escalates to you know paralysis and even death in a span of just two to three hours. So it's pretty uh, it's, it's a pretty serious condition when you consume these contaminated shellfish, and there's no method out there in the market right now which can detect the presence of these toxins by using a biological matrix. There are some methods which can detect using shellfish matrix. Like they can take a shellfish matrix and say whether this has been exposed to or not exposed to a toxin. But there's no method out there right now which can take a biological human matrix to detect whether or not the person is exposed to that particular toxin. So I, my whole research is about developing a diagnostic method which can extract these toxins from biological matrices and detect by using, you know, or quantitate by using LCMS. As a part of my research, I have used these extraction techniques like solid phase extraction and immunoaffinity extraction using agros beads, where I have these exposed specimens which I got from Alaska and I extracted the toxins from these samples and um, I validated the method according to bioanalytical FDA guidance. So this is my whole project. Apart from the paralytic shellfish poisoning, we even worked on pesticide poisoning. So, you know, like pesticides are also being used uh, very widely for a lot of food products. So uh, we have developed a method to detect whether or not a person has been ex exposed to a pesticide poisoning. That is one of the project which we worked on in our lab. And uh, I think there's one more project which is currently in progress for nuclear warfare poisoning. So basically our lab deals with different kinds of poisonings and uh, to develop a very unique diagnostic method which can detect and quantitate your exposure. So for as far as my method is concerned, uh, like I said, there's no method out there right now which can detect this poisoning. And I have recently sent it for a publication, so I'm just waiting for their uh, uh, decision. But uh, yeah, this is all about my uh, project and analytical toxicology part. Uh, Deepika? Yeah. Uh, shall I put on question, sir? I'll finish it off, then you can go with her. Uh, my question is, how do you want to take your career forward after your PhD? Okay, so uh, this is the right question for me right now because I'm at this juncture of my career where I'm taking the next step. I'll be almost done with my PhD and I have to step into the real world. So I am considering a wide variety of opportunities. So I have applied to some fellowship positions at FDA, uh, CDC and NIH. And uh, uh, like given an opportunity, I would like to pursue my fellowship further. Uh, in one of these organizations where I can expand my research acumen and, you know, like get more exposed to some practical skills. And after that, I would like to uh, work in this field of bioanalytical sector and uh, also immunology. So where you can interact uh, with a wide, wide variety of analytical techniques. I keep saying analytical techniques because I would say that is the love of my life. I just uh, enjoy working with analytical techniques. So I would like to stay in this particular field and try to develop more, uh, uh, you know, accurate uh, methods for various kinds of issues. Okay, very good. It uh, shows your uh, passion and uh, attitude towards research and analysis of uh, drugs. Okay, it's very good. Uh, I have a simple question for you. Uh, if you are asked to guide a, a student to get a PhD in uh, US, uh, for example, you think uh, Mercer University itself, how will you guide him? 
or uh, what sort of preparations uh, the candidate should take uh, to get an uh, secure seat in uh, uh, Mercer's University? What's right. advice for him? Right. So yeah. I, in fact, I've like quite a few people have asked me this before, like, how do I proceed? So the first thing I just tell them is like, first, uh, identify your interest. Just realize what your interest is in. Do you like working in pharmacology field? You love working with analytical techniques or do you want to do something in formulation and drug delivery? What is your interest? Like, where do your interest lies? So based on that, you'll have to pick a research field. That is very important because I would say PhD is a, such a long commitment. You cannot just force yourself through it. You need to love what you're doing. So I would say pick such a field which you enjoy working so that it will be much easier for you to work. Um, so that would be my first advice. Identify what you like, your research interest. And then, uh, of course, uh, technically, you'll have to go through a series of tests. Uh, the first thing is like you to secure any admit in the US, you'll have to give a GRE and a TOEFL exam. And each, each university has their, uh, uh, you know, like a cutoff range. Some univers universities need a 314 or a 310. It depends. It depends on the university you're applying. So uh, shortlist a few of the universities which are working in your research interest. You know, like go through the professor profiles. Like, you know, like if you pick up, for example, take Mercer University, if you select Mercer University, see, go through each professor's profile. What is their research interest? What are they doing currently in the lab? Does it interest you? Then I would say if one particular professor seems very interesting for you, send them an email. Send them an email and show them that you're interested in working in their lab. Because uh, I would say in master's work differently, you just have to submit your application, give the exams, and then secure the admit. But PhD works a little bit different because uh, the intake is very, 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 very small. They just take like four to five students. At the max, they take 10 students per uh, intake. So you need to clearly show that you are different from them because you are really interested to work in that particular field and uh, share your resume and uh, share your uh, research experience and tell them that you are interested in so and so fields. And first, before doing all that, just learn what they are doing first. So then it will be easy to interact. And uh, then, of course, uh, when, when you do that simultaneously, you write your GRE, you write your TOEFL. And uh, then you have to write your own SOP, which is Statement of Purpose. This is, uh, it, it is kind of an essay, which would say, like, why you are interested in PhD. I would say, like, whatever you professors are asking me, that you put it in a paper, you know, like how you started your journey, why you're interested in PhD. Everything, when you write it in the form of an essay, it is called Statement of Purpose. So write your own statement of purpose and get some letter of recommendations from esteemed professors like you, uh, you know, who recommend that particular student is apt or he is, is eligible to pursue a PhD. So when you finish all these admission requirements, uh, you apply it to the university. And uh, that is any student would do that. But I would say separately, I would ask, I would suggest to contact the professor personally, send them an email, you know, uh, share your research experience, tell them that you're interested in what they're doing and how it will help them to shape their future. That way you have more chances in landing up an admission in that university. So that's how I would say this proceed. Shall I add one more small question to it? If uh, the candidate is having a couple of uh, research publications, will it add any more uh, uh, benefit to him? It, it definitely it is definitely a, an added advantage because if you have a publication it means that you did some authentic research right you published something it means that you did some research so whatever research is good research even though it gave you a negative result it is still good because you know what went wrong and you know what you should do the next time so even though it is a negative result or you didn't expect that result but still it is good research so if you publish any data I would say just uh, just present it, just not publication. If you presented your work in some conference, that will also be an added advantage because you are ready to showcase your research to a wide audience, right? That shows you're confident about what you did and you know what you're doing. So uh, that will definitely be an added advantage. In fact, I, I just wanted to add a little bit here. 
in bachelors i have almost given like five or six conference presentations wales university has given me that wonderful opportunity to go to i think i presented at srm i presented at bangalore and i presented at ipa conventions so all these presentations also uh, helped me a lot to secure the phd admit because people know that i have a little bit of exposure with presentations and publications yeah so it's almost 1 hour and 10 minutes with you tujha it's very really good uh, being on a good sunday morning evening for us and a sunday morning for you yeah and for dr satish to give his concluding remark so stay back on the show yeah dr satish to give your concluding remarks so it's very interesting to talk with deepika that a different uh, topic called uh, uh, toxicology that is analytical toxicology so it's very interesting topic and uh, uh, it's uh, really uh, informative for everyone and uh, uh, the important thing i want to say to the people here uh, uh, is that if you are looking for an admission to phd in us definitely you should prepare mentally and uh, physically for that so uh, you write gre you prepare for gre in that aspect uh, you can get a very good score simply uh, getting uh, an eligibility is not uh, sufficient you should have a very good score in gre so that the professors will have a positive attitude towards you there will be lot of competition uh, when compared to uh, uh, other uh, courses and for particularly pharmaceutical sciences have very limited number of opportunities in us uh, and so uh, we must prepare well for that your uh, gre scores should have been uh, very high and uh, you should you can have a number of publications uh, whenever possible if your pg work or uh, something or some research work pursue you can publish it and at least you can uh, 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 show in some conferences present in some conferences and they can have certificates of that and uh, you collect recommendation letters from your professors and all those will uh, we can do as a platform for preparation for admission in us uh, so actually uh, she very correctly told there are two sessions in uh, for admission in us so uh, don't try for the nearest one because it will be always very hard for you to uh, get it so you plan for the next one so that you can very comfortably have all these uh, qualifications and eligibilities you can fulfill all those things and uh, get for it and uh, beyond everything passion is very important you have you should have a very strong passion to uh, do research uh, without that you don't put it, put your legs into that and it will be very difficult for you to come out there so uh, with this note uh, today we are signing out and uh, uh, i'm uh, very uh, thankful to deepika for giving such a beautiful uh, talk over this uh, topic and uh, giving a very good guidance for the students thank you thank you so my thing to conclude is that is uh, she has uh, from b form she had a passion for analytical techniques and she is pursuing a passion in masters as well as in phd same thing if you have a passion on particular area continue the passion instead of jumping to other area that you don't have a passion or you don't have a experience so you start to have a expertise on one field and try to explore that field and have a flying colors in your life and that is one thing and uh, the people who are sorting for admission in psc maybe in india or abroad anywhere my suggestion is to draft a proposal of first before approaching any guide because any guide will be wanting you to see on what area you are strengthened and what area you want to work upon so if that matches with their interest they will immediately they'll be able to have a discussion on you so instead of simple actually communicating the professors by email is very important at the same time be able to give a one page or two page write up on you what is your thing and what you want to carry forward your strength on a particular aspect if, if the frequency of both the guide and the student matches immediately you can have a thing along with your gre and your letter of recommendation everything that can be a supportive documents for getting into all this so with this note it's nice to be uh, talking with one of our alumni uh, from b farm to us uh, to us and she's going to all the best deepika for your uh, future submission for your phd and a very good defense so we'll again we'll be in touch with you it's not a one day show we'll be in touch with you 
So sure. we'll be asking uh, you to, whenever you're free, we can have a session with our students exclusively for both in analysis as well as uh, how to take forward the career in the PhD in the US and other things. So sure. that will be adding a thing. So it's with this note, we are former duos are signing off with a wonderful guest for international guest today. And I uh, hope we will be coming with another good guest on the next episode on next Sunday. So till then, tada, bye bye. See you. So it's Farmer Duo signing off for tonight. Thank you very much. Bye. bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.